Thanks for coming. Okay. So, uh, net art, roughly speaking, is any kind of art that uses the internet uh, that's embedded in a browser, and specifically that like it can't really be extricated from the browser. It's it's like tied to the browser in some way. It uses a browser API or something. It doesn't really make sense to like you know print out an image and have it up on a gallery wall. So what's cool about our um, net? So the first thing is that it it is so tied to like the experience of sitting and using a web browser. So like looking at a work of net art often involves sitting some, usually by yourself in front of a computer looking at a screen instead of the more sort of traditional ways of just engaging with art, which involves like going to a gallery, standing like with your finger on your mouth, like oh yeah, very interesting, you know, and pondering this thing. So it's very much like an internet um, centric medium. Um, internet distribution of art is also pretty crazy because until about 20 years ago, you had to like get up off your butt, get up off your butt, and go to a museum, pay for access, go see all of these things, and now anybody can like download these works uh, and just sort of see them in their, in their home. Um, net art often questions how we use the internet, how the internet uses us, how we sort of engage with things that we find on the internet, and. Uh, what kind of an effect that has on our culture and the way that we interact with each other. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, and then the last thing that's really cool about net art is that the web is this platform that's being developed by like hundreds of thousands of people all around the world and, and APIs are coming out all the time and like, you know, JavaScript is this like insane language that now has this crazy ecosystem around it. And like that is the kind of toolbox and the kind of platform that you don't often find in our world. I mean, somebody who's like really good at charcoal isn't super excited about charcoal v like 1.8 coming out next year that's gonna like totally change the way that they make charcoal drawings. You know what I mean? Like, so that's really cool. And you see this with um, like the piece that we use as a sound check. Uh, it is it extensively uses WebGL, um, and that's a technology that's like totally in flux and still totally new. And so people are like finding all these cool new ways of using it to make really interesting art. So I think that's pretty exciting. So I'll start off with a couple of examples. Um, the first one is called Summer by Olia Leonina. Uh, and I may mess up that name the second time I say it. Um, it's a pretty straightforward piece, but if you'll see what's going on, it's, a, it's an animation of, uh, I believe that's the artist, swinging in this, in this swing. But every frame of the animation is stored on a separate URL. And so as you watch the piece, your browser is just getting constantly redirected to this sequence of URLs. And so I think it's a good kind of, this is actually a really well-known work of net art. Um, it's a good kind of intro to the genre because it, you know, obviously you couldn't show this in a gallery without setting up a computer with a web browser open running the site, right? Uh, it's, it's like totally involved in, in this, in like having a network that you can access that has a bunch of different so sort of individual frames of this piece. Uh, I think it's really playful, kind of carefree, uh, kind of like the way that we use the internet. It, you know, like like when I'm surfing the net, I often just can kind of jump in between a bunch of sites and lay around and looking at different stuff. And it kind of has that vibe about it. Um, and then the other thing is that if you look at the source of one of these websites, it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's you've got this this chain of all the sites. Each site knows which step it's on, and then it just kind of redirects you to the next site. So it's a it's a very sort of basically built site, um, but it's this this piece has received some degree of renown in the net art world. So that's kind of cool. Uh, the next one is Young Hei Chang Heavy Industry Thing, and uh, this one oh, right here, open. pretty cool. Uh, it takes a second. The whole piece is, about, I don't know, it's like four or five minutes, but I'll just show you the first 30 seconds or so.
video it's not like embedded in this whole UI that's meant to be like shareable and navigable and see this other thing it's a single site um, and that's the way that a lot of network works exists on the internet there's just like one site you go to it and then you see this this piece the other thing is that you know in just about every like video based every every video that you watch on the internet is going to have some ability to like search through the video to scroll through a specific point something like that but um, this piece and, and Young Mitch on Heavy Industries do a lot of uh, pieces like that. They're very much like you sit down, you see the, the work, you have this experience, and that's it. That's like the whole you have to kind of kind of go to the work and engage with it rather than like being able to kind of jump around in it like a music video or something. Um, so that's kind of a cool one. Got a couple more examples. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, works of net art that kind of like plays with everything about the internet um, you know, in a really cool way. And we'll see how this works. <laughs> so this is another one that's uh, pretty much a video, but it hopefully it I don't know what that point is. Um, but it uses it uses pop-up windows in the browser for the user. Um, so this is by a, a net artist named Young Jake, who is like a rapper and uh, and possibly also a web developer who plays around a lot with like web apps and, and the ways that we use social sharing to kind of the way that that changes our, uh, our interaction with each other. And he, his work is filled with a lot of these kind of visual puns and, and verbal puns and stuff. Uh, you know, uh, he's also got a great software, um, which is something that you can say about most of the people that are profiled uh, in this introduction, uh, that they all have pretty cool. Uh, they're all like very engaged in uh, internet sharing stuff and, and social media. So I'm hoping, I don't know if this is going to if this is going to pan out, it, uh, it should work, but there might be something about like the way that this is running on two screens. I don't know who wants to I'll just show you like the beginning of this because it is pretty good. This is, note that this is. Whatever that means, 
anybody that, that, that it should it always has to say sort of on the open internet. Like you can't password protect it or um, you know take it offline and put it in some gallery or something like that on computer. And so up in the title it says it's in the collection of Benjamin, I think it's Benjamin Palmer. Um, and and that's kind of the only indication that this is actually an owned artwork. Um, yeah, so right, so the buyer signed a contract that said it's a book. So the next question is kind of why is all this stuff interesting? Um, I think that there's this fundamental tension between the internet as an open platform and the way that the way that art usually works. Uh, this concept of having an artwork that you can possess. Um, usually, the source code for net art pieces is unobfuscated. It's just there. It's not always like GPU or GPL licensed. Sorry, too many pop crackers recently. Uh, it's not how the GPL license or, or um, you know, similarly like expressly open source license, but I think that within the NetArt community there's a sense that if you want to download somebody's code and hack it and change it, remix it and upload a new version of it, nobody would really get up in arms because that idea of like remix culture is very much kind of interwoven in the whole, the whole NetArt idea. Um, a good example of that is like the 3JS playground that I showed you before where you can take people's sketches and you can just edit them in a different version. Um, so, so I think that's that's a really interesting thing. Art that exists on the internet is very hard to own. Um, it's very hard to restrict access to it, um, and so it, it it creates this kind of much more open environment for the creation of art. Um, net art, in this sense, represents kind of a challenge to the art establishment. If you think about how uh, what sort of like the industry of art is, the business of art is big museums and big collectors and the agencies that sell artworks to those big museums and collectors. And they have a really hard time dealing with something that's as ethereal as a website, something you can easily copy and redistribute, um, and something that's very hard to own and to keep locked up inside, you know, behind the doors of, a, of an institution. Um, and so they're kind of coming to terms with that, but I think it's a cool thing to just kind of keep an eye on. Now the ability to uh, access a a piece of art that's on the internet is itself a kind of privileged access thing. Um, it's not something that the whole world has access to, but that's a discussion for another talk. Uh, but I thought I'd put that in there because it's, it's something to kind of keep in mind. Um, yeah, and then the status of being open is often really very explicit by the artist. That's, that's very much, that's not just a side effect of the art existing on the internet, that's very much part of the reason why the artists like working with that medium. Yeah, so, and then I think the last reason why it's interesting is that it's a creative use of the internet. Um, if, you, if you've ever sat down and just like opened up your text editor, and here I'm assuming that a lot of people are programmers, but um, if, if you just started like working on a site that has no practical use and that has no, you don't have to worry about user data or anything, the only idea is to make something that looks cool that people are gonna like playing around with. It's really fun, it's really liberating, and kind of, you, all the like worries about uh, validation and data consistency and, and all this like syncing with the server and stuff go right out the window and it's just about making some cool fun thing for people to like click on and so that's that's like that's great and it kind of brings some of that joy back to uh, you know programming and, and working with code. Um, the, the browser is this amazing platform now um, and the fact that it's this sort of standardized way of seeing this program that anybody can use and that should work um, no matter what your computer setup is, and you can download it as soon as you need it, you know, it's, it's, so it's always kind of updated and fresh. That, to me, is kind of like a promise of what Java was back in its heyday, and now I'm getting Java not used so much on the internet, but um, like native JavaScript and HTML5 provided you guys for doing really cool creative stuff. Uh, the influence of the Flash community is pretty huge. Flash was a way that a lot of, I think, designers and more creative people got interested in coding, and you have these stories in the creative code community of people who were, were designers, classically trained as, as art students, and then they were using the Adobe suite, they started opening up Adobe Flash to do animations, they started hearing about this thing called Action Script, and then they were just down the rabbit hole, and now all of a sudden they're all like programmers and hackers and making creative code. Um, so even though Flash is no longer really used for a lot of that work, uh, except for Things like the Young K Chang heavy industry stuff and early rap or most of all pieces are made with Flash. Um, that is still a very important, uh, sort of important grounding for a lot of people in the, in the creative code community. Um, 
another the thing that's interesting about net art is how you have these collaborations between artists and programmers. So uh, the piece, if no yes .com, the, the Raphael Rosendahl piece that was sold at auction, that was actually, I think, I think the way it worked, it was conceptualized by this guy, Raphael Rosendahl, and all the code was written by somebody else, who gets a lot less credit for it. Uh, but he works as kind of a, a, a constant collaborator with Rosendahl and builds a lot of his a lot of his sites. So if you you know if you crack open the source of the site and stuff, you can see the, his his name credited there. Um, but it, it's something that's not always made explicit when people are talking about net art. I think that's because people focus on sort of the artist and the person that conceptualized it. Um, but you do see these relationships where you have kind of artists and coders working side by side. Vince McKelly is another example. Works with a lot of other artists and also does some stuff. Um, and then another cool thing about net art that I feel like I should mention is these kind of groups, or um, you know, like in art history you talk about like the impressionists or the surrealists, or Dadaists, kind of movements of people that were localized in a certain place and time and made certain art with certain <coughs> characteristics. Uh, and I think you kind of start to see that with internet-based art. Um, like on Tumblr, there's a big community of people that make cool gifts using processing. Processing is this uh, framework written in Java for the creative code. And I think that's kind of cool. You see these little like, pockets of creativity, and if you, if you explore them, you can find them and, and see some pretty cool things. Uh, so, yeah, that's everything. Yeah, and the last thing is this, uh, this phenomenon of the Paddleton auction, which was. Uh, it's ongoing, there are going to be more of them, but it's a digital art auction for traditional collectors and institutions to come in and uh, try to buy these things. Um, websites have been sold at auction, gifts have been sold at auction. Uh, it's a really weird timeline for people who are more involved in like, the monetary business side of, of art because it's tricky to figure out how you commodify and monetize something like a gift, which is totally ethereal. Uh, and has already surely been copied you know, thousands of times. But uh, I think that the Paddles on auction represents a pretty interesting, um, a pretty interesting development in terms of the art world. And uh, I think that you can expect to see a lot more of that kind of thing where uh, people in the art world will be getting involved with just showing digital art in galleries and also trying to buy it and acquire it. Although a lot of that stuff still hasn't been figured out, a lot of how that how exactly that works or what you know, like if you wanted to do a digital art exhibition, would it just be a bunch of like laptops open in a gallery that people would go up to and use? You know, so nobody's really figured that out yet. Um, this is a link to the uh, to the website. I think there's actually another edition of this going on. Yeah, through July, so that's like a couple weeks. So somebody to keep an eye on. Uh, anyway, the last question is, how do you make that art? And this is kind of where my talk. Uh, goes off into the, the more technical side. Um, you've got your pick of 2D graphics libraries. Uh, some of these use the Canvas API, part of HTML5. Some of them use SVG, which I guess is part of HTML5, although I think it has a slightly longer history. Um, and I, in my day job, I work at a data visualization company. We do a lot of little data visualization based websites. Uh, and these libraries are great for data visualization if you're interested in that too. Um, the 3D libraries that I'll talk about, or libraries that I'll talk about in a second, is not so much because it's grown to a lot of like exploding 3D pie charts. Nobody's really figured out how to do 3D data this day. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so EaselJS is good, SVGJS. EJS uh, is, a, is a renderer specific, uh, sorry, renderer agnostic uh, library with libraries on the render that where you can render to Canvas or to SVG, um, or one other, I forget. Uh, I think there's a, there's a genome based. There is a way to do that. Yeah, and then Paper.js is a, is a JavaScript implementation of uh, PostScript, I think it's called. So it's, it's like an Adobe yeah, like script cool. thing. Yeah, I'm not totally, I don't really know anything about the whole Adobe world. I'm from like the generation of web devs that came in post Flash, so I have like no experience with Flash or Adobe or all that stuff. But Paper.js, I think, is a way to do PostScript on online. Um, yeah, and then the other one that you see a lot is 3JS, which I've probably all heard of. Uh, it's kind of become the, the standard WebGL library that people get into when they first start getting interested in uh, 3D graphics on a, uh, in a browser. 
it's got a huge number of contributors. It's a very widely used library. Um, but I found in doing the uh, example that I took here for this talk that it's not so good for beginners. Now, I don't have any sort of 3D graphics training or, or background. And so having a library where the, the kind of fundamental understanding of like, how do you get a bunch of texture pixels on the screen? And like, what is a UV map and stuff? It was totally over my head. So it was, there's, a, there's a steep learning curve for getting that stuff. Um, and then another problem with 3JS is that the, it's in beta, the API is constantly developing. The technology that it's all based on, MetGL, is still in constant flux, and browser support for different features is really widely varying and, and different. So that can be kind of frustrating. And, and there's a huge problem with open source stuff that the documentation doesn't keep up with the pace of development. So you find cases where the documentation is outdated, or tutorials become outdated because the API has changed in some way. So that can be really frustrating, but the fact that you can basically build like a 3D game in the browser, you know, it would be a big pain to download all those files every time you wanted to play the game, but you could do that, I think is really cool. Uh, it's a good example of how 3D technology, or, or how, how browser technology is growing a lot. Uh, and there are all these you know, exciting things you can do with it that nobody's really, you know, it's not, it's not an established thing. Um, 3JS, I think, is eventually going to be like the jQuery of 3D, like the library that everybody uses, but it's still in this like nascent state of, of total flux. So it's, it's kind of an exciting place to, to get involved. Uh, and then the last thing is, can you give me an example? So this is a little like net art e example that I put together, um, where you're kind of in space, and this is going to be super confusing because yeah, there we go. Okay. It was as if it wasn't hard enough to use a computer for it, and that was also this like crazy camera thing on it. So I just got all these like random cubes uh, inside of a circle, and a sphere really that's textured with this space uh, background. And you can do cool stuff like upload your own file. Here's the code for the matrix. Why don't all the cubes? <laughs> <laughs> and so, so can we get a little rocket ship? Can we fire the <laughs> smaller cubes? Absolutely, you could. Uh, you, you're absolutely free to download the source for this and yeah. hack away. Um, and then another kind of cool thing is you can use like uh, the uh, the user media API and you know use like the webcam up, but you know, it's all on screen, right? So you can do some pretty cool stuff with. Uh, with 3D in the browser, um, and with just all the crazy browser APIs that are, uh, that are being developed right now and are being developed. Um, yeah, so that is about, that's everything uh, that I had to say. So, um, yeah, so thanks very much. Uh, so, yeah, I got it's 11 31, so 15 minutes for questions. Yeah. Anybody have any questions or want to talk about other cool projects or what we have? Go out there every lunch break. Yeah. Um, this was a couple years ago now, but I, I think I remember Rihanna, so Rihanna did a Saturday Night Live performance mm -hmm. where she used like some net RD type stuff as her, her video projection background. And, and there was kind of a lot of like clamor about that's not fair, it's not an appropriate use of that art, or somehow like it's it's a it's a, a corruption of what that art is supposed to be about. Um, I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about about like you know big commercial entities sort of appropriating that aesthetic and Yeah, I mean, because there is that sort of tension between like an art medium that's open and it should be free and it should be easy for anybody to come and find and hack and mess with. And then like having a, a giant established pop star come in and sort of like borrow those tropes. You know, I'm I'm not a I don't consider myself a net artist. I just consider myself somebody that finds this stuff really cool and exciting to follow. So and I'm also not somebody who's prone to like arbitrating on cultural issues like that because I feel like it's you know, too big of a question to say definitive that's right or that's wrong. Um, if, like, frankly, if you ask me, I think it's kind of cool that there's this 
there's this like mainstream interest in this in this weird uh, kind of like subgenre of, of very art people that are getting really into making stuff on the internet. And uh, I don't know. It, I, I mean, maybe if, if it was something where the the work that she was using was specifically supposed to not ever be used for um, like a like a corporate venture or money making venture, then I can see that that would be that would be a classic concern. But, but. I think the more specific claim was that she was co-opting a subculture that had an internal. Uh, style of communication. Mm -hmm. And so instead of putting them up on stage to say, hey, look at these people doing this art, uh, she replicated their work without without acknowledging the culture that it had come out of. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if it's not with credit, then that, yeah, I should see that. I mean, it's not capitalism, is it? <laughs> you know, like, I have a fine line to walk. Yeah, yeah. it's. Yeah, I, I, I totally, and I, I was going to sympathize with anybody that felt agreed by that, especially if she had to say, like, use an artist's work without crediting them. For sure, that's, that's just a big creative faux pas. Um, but it's like, that, that's kind of the, you know, ironically, that's kind of the price you pay for making your stuff free, right? Is that anybody can take it and, and do what they want with it, even if that person happens to be somebody with as much money and influence and ability to actually give back as Rihanna. So, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough one, but it, uh, I definitely sympathize with that argument. Uh, sorry, do you have a question? Uh, I was going to say, like, you said that the 3.js was hard. I, I found it very difficult as a total 3D beginner, yeah. But I, I, I was just going to say, like, when I got started in 3D programming, it's just like, I mean, it, I, I was dealing with uh, a language that was fairly easy to use and operate. And okay. And like still, it took like months to yeah. like actually really understand it. I think there's a pretty steep learning curve of like the fundamentals of um, you, there's a lot of like 3D math, a lot of vectors and matrix transformations and stuff. And uh, full disclosure, I majored in economics in college, and I don't have the like strongest in the CS heavy math background. Um, so that stuff is really tricky. And then like. You know, what's the texture? How does that work? And you get that onto a cube, that kind of stuff is really blowing my mind. I mean, I would, if you're interested in this stuff, I'd definitely recommend like getting into it. I've yet to find the one like key that unlocks the whole thing. So I'm still looking. So if you have any good questions, so sorry, was that was that everything you sure? Yeah. If, um, so so that was kind of why I found the video as frustrating. I was just going to say, if, um, so you said uh, that you came into development um, post Flash days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then um, I was just wondering if you know about any of the history of like um, that kind of came out in the very early web days with Common Classic. With any what? of those guys? Common Classic? How do you spell that? C A R M I N K A R S I C. Oh, cool. Um, and Carmen Karasik was actually the woman that created the world's first um, denial of service um, Java and it being, yeah, so that's her. So it's a very old site, like if you look at it, go to the web art stuff that she has. I mean, this is more so, I guess, just from a historical perspective, uh -huh. um, from <laughs> one of us oldies. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and so she actually created what she used to be a, a she very big um, uh, uh, programmer at IBM. Um, and then she kind of left there to do online uh, distribution. And so the electronic di uh, dis disturbance theater was uh, some of the original, uh, the original creator of the world's first um, net being that, you know, as I said, did the denial of service attack that kind of went on and just, hello, can I have some information? Hello, can I have some information? And if you look at, yeah, flood nets, if you actually are interested in some of the historical stuff and also a bit of historical stuff about online activism and stuff as well, she's a fantastic person. Um, to look into and just from a historical perspective yeah. and stuff, but this is, this is <laughs> I I'll, just share. Uh, I'll definitely yeah, explore this more. And it's really like a link in this yeah, book. and as I said, like if you look at it, it's it's because it's using and her stuff originated kind of back in the days where we didn't really even have so back then CSS was just still, right. you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it's just an interesting one from um, a historical perspective and also yeah from the uh, activism side of kind of all of that. And yeah, she, I think she's about 40, 
he's about like you know late probably in her late 50s or something now early 60s maybe hitting into that but um she was like in her mid 40s when she just turned around and went I can't handle this this big corporate kind of coding stuff anymore and I'm gonna dye my hair blue and go and kind of join this stuff and, and do web art so cool. yeah. yeah I'll love it <laughs> one more question uh yeah do you have a question oh uh yeah um do you have any like of these artists that um, sort of reveal their secrets or like live stream any of their like process or anything like that? Yeah, process stuff. I have no idea. I, would I mean, love to see like that would be really revealing in terms of like how to get started. With it. Yeah, it would be. One thing I would say is if you see a piece. Uh, that you like, you can always just view source and you can check out the, and usually the source code is simply on obfuscated, you can just check it out and see what's going on. And, you know, like, um, I guess so, you know, you see this GIF, like, oh, yeah, you know, it's are crazy. sideway that's controlling the position of the yeah. 3D, like, yeah, that, uh, the, so the experience that I have is with people that are on Tumblr and posting a lot of cool GIFs on Tumblr, you've got like beads and bombs and P5 art, and there's a blog called uh, FY Processing, which I think. Um, and the people that get posted on that are active in that community, usually if you ask them, hey, this particular gift is really cool, can you share the source code for that? They'll post it on Facebook or GitHub or something. Okay. Or um, openprocessing.org is, um, is a really cool, I think it's not a word. Um, Do you have like a bookmark yeah, folder of all these? Do I have a bookmark folder? Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I, have, have, uh, uh, I have this whole thing of like examples. Um, and so there's some interacting that I found cool. These are some crazy. You should take that folder and just like take that. All your posts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this one is so cool. I really like this. It's just what? like this weird like, graphics thing. That you can anyway, so there's been like a lot of cool. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff on. on the internet. Um, but yeah, so it's oh, yeah, this one was making it around like, you know, This is I, I'm not sure exactly how this is made, but the idea is to create an infinite sunset that uh, it's a kind of digital sunset that always captures the exact moment where the sun is over. So like there's a lot of examples of stuff like this. Um, and I can put them all in the speaker notes or maybe I'll maybe I'll add another slide to this. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, this is where the slides are. Yeah. Um, how is all this stuff going out to mobile? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. To, to speak of bringing it out of our galleries and into actual physical space. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think with, so. A lot of a lot of websites are going to be the kind of thing where you open it up on your phone and it's just a tiny little version of the website and you can't really use it. Uh, there, you do see people. Like when it comes to really inter integrating mobile phones with an artwork, I think the thing that I've seen the most often is somebody will have like it'll be at an event, they'll have a big installation or a big piece, and then there's a there's a web app that you can go to on your phone and interact with that piece in some way. So oh, there's actually a really good example of that. It, um, there was a there was like a big sort of canvas that was strung up over a harbor, I think in either Toronto or Montreal for a festival. And there were like these lights being projected onto the underside of this like big great sculpture, and then people could use their phones to go to a web app and then like draw on their phones, and the drawings that they were making would be like created in big illuminated lights on this massive sculpture. There's a lot of things like that in Montreal. Yeah, yeah. I think right right now there's one where there's a conveyor belt and a bunch of colored blocks, and you put the blocks on the conveyor belt. And as they go through the conveyor belt, their like, color is picked up by some color sensors and then it's projected on a building. So each, like, as the blocks go through, they go up to the next level of the building. So you can create this like, pattern of like blocks. Awesome. Like, that's a Here in Art and City, there's a project where the historic elevator is lit up at night by art. And they, it's very similar to what's going on here. Yeah, so, so every night. Yeah, that, that's. I've heard about that. Um, I didn't hear about it until I came across the bridge and it was flashing. <laughs> yeah.
we do a festival that in Sydney, the Vivid Festival, where literally the large parts of Sydney just become interactive and the old buildings are interactive and then there's like ones that are where people can go and play with it and also help to create the art and stuff. Like if you're ever in Sydney <laughs> in summer. <laughs> So you see this a lot where people use, you know, inter integrate uh, mobile phone use with an um, In terms of making, you know, it's, it's very tricky to make an artwork responsive because usually you're working within a specific amount of space and it's tough to like scale that down or change it to make it a mobile version. Um, and then the mobile version might be with here and like a full desktop screen. So I think people are kind of going with one or the other. Yeah, uh, I know. I know the new bridge that's uh, mostly constructed in Portland. Oh yeah, the cables on it are white because they're. I think I'm doing projection mapping on it. Oh, nice. cool! That's awesome. Mm -hmm. about that. Let's go for that. Um, yeah. So, so that kind of big public art is like a whole other, uh, it's a whole other world of interesting stuff you're doing with, uh, with code. That starts to get more into the world of like what I would call creative coding, which there's a lot of overlap between like the creative coding people and the other people, um, but uh, but not completely. And so when you start talking about creative coding, you start talking about frameworks like Processing and Cinder and Open Frameworks, um, kind of the big three that people use to make uh, these really cool creative apps for installations or just interesting visual effects or, or audio reacting sounds. Or just that's a whole I'm wondering if things like white skin and house for dance and whatever from back in the human day. Yeah. Those like are they like proto net art or are they completely like not considered that or like where? I think I think if you like if you want to talk about the, the particular movement that's happening now. A lot of those people would say, oh yeah, I remember seeing those websites as a kid and being like, oh, this is so fun. And that kind of, like, the internet of the 1990s and early 2000s feel is, a, is an aesthetic that people borrow from, um, where they, they kind of transform what people were doing on the internet into an aesthetic that they now kind of employ as part of their artworks. Um, I wouldn't say that it's part of the same kind of movement, because I see that movement as originating really in the um, just in the past half a decade, but um, but really that question boils down to like what is art, and so I would say that Amsterdam dance is a kind of art, and it exists on the internet, so that's that art. Is it like prov provenance and like whether it was a related? Uh, so there's, you're saying there's not a continuity between that set of art and this, but there's a reference. Yeah. I, you know, I, I can't, of course I can't speak for anybody, but it, because I, and I'm also not like a, like a net art historian per se, but I think that like people that were looking at creative uses of the internet would probably trace its genesis back to like, you know, the first time somebody shared a GIF on, or posted a GIF on a GIF page or something, and then you get that whole like, the hamster dance era of the internet, if you want to call it that, and uh, the white and then he kind of the early on. And so, yeah, I'd say those are all like, Parts of the same big story, um, but maybe if you want to talk about like net art as just today, um, I think I would call that part of the same. Okay, that's time. Yeah. Oh, Thank very you. much. Everybody, give a hand.